Welcome to People I Know Show, a podcast about interesting people, personal growth, and being wrong. I'm your host, Kurt Karstensen. Regular listeners of the podcast through now 25 episodes probably noticed that the people I know, the people I've had on the show so far, are from a variety of aspects of my life. Some family and close friends, some people I've met just a few times and don't know well, and anything in between, including some that come from a place nowhere near where I'm from. What they have in common, though, is that they're interesting to me, they've influenced my life in some way, and I have them tell me something they were wrong about. All while capturing a conversation we can always look back on and potentially cherish. For this episode, I returned to my hometown of Browerville, Minnesota, a small town of about 750 people, two hours northwest of Minneapolis. I was there a few weeks ago to help my mom celebrate her birthday. While in town, I had the opportunity to reconnect with an influential person from my past, someone without having this podcast I might never have reached out to like I did. On today's episode, I have a candid conversation with PJ Sutliff. He's the person for the last 20 years that I've considered to be my favorite teacher from high school. As you'll learn in the conversation, he and I haven't interacted a whole lot since I graduated in that class of 53 people from Rarvel High School in 2001. PJ is now principal of the high school. He's fire chief in Browerville. You'll get a sense of how small Browerville is and maybe what it's like to live there. High school sports are a big deal. And New England Patriots quarterback Tom Brady made Browerville famous for a few days last year. I hope you enjoy learning a little bit about where I came from with my conversation with PJ Sutliff. I'm back in my hometown of Browerville, Minnesota for today's episode of People I Know Show and joined by... A former teacher of mine from way back in the day when I was in high school, P.J. Sutliff. You don't have to say way back in the day. Well, it was way back in the day. I can't lie to anyone that might be listening to us here today. Hello, P.J. Hello, Kurt. Thank you for taking the time today. Sure. I, I'm trying to think back to precisely the time that I thought about having you on with me, and I think it was a few weeks ago when I was talking to my friend Steph McPhail for a previous episode of the podcast. She's a teacher, and somewhere during the conversation with her or while hanging out with her afterwards, I thought about I should have my favorite teacher from high school on, and that guy, that person, is you. There's a lot of oh. teachers that I enjoyed, but I, I think maybe I've told you this before, but not a long time. You still come to mind when I think about my favorite teacher. So, Well, I was, I was expecting you to say my favorite teacher, but he died, so then <laughs> you came along. Nope. No. Well, it's very nice to hear. It's like the teacher's dream is when somebody comes back and they say you were, you know, influential in some way. So I'm, I'm making your dreams come true today? Yes. Yes. It's, it is a good feeling. Yeah. You know, there's really not a lot of reward for teaching aside from maybe that. And I'm trying to think back to precisely why I thought you were the, my favorite teacher and think that. And I know that most of my time with you as a teacher, maybe every class I had was the current events class, which I took. Every year, I don't I mean that's maybe a class you can keep taking because you're talking about current events. So it, the the material changes, but I think I took it three of my four years of high school. Yeah, you were in there a lot, and you you buried your nose in the sports page most of the time, if I remember correctly. That's true, and I agree with that. But you were the first person to ever get me out of the sports page, which we had to for that class. You you had to. You you should be aware of what's going on around you. So that that was the whole point of the class, and yeah, it's it's considered a. Uh, project-based class, kind of like woodshop. You're not making the same gun cabinet, so you can take woodshop more than once. And colleges don't look badly upon that. If you take world geography more than once, colleges don't wonder what's happening. <laughs> they, they look closely at those trans transcripts and find that? Yeah, they do sometimes. You you taught that. I, I don't know if that class was here in Browerville before you arrived. I know that you arrived. It must have been right around the time that I became a freshman in high school. Maybe you were there a year before me, but that would have been late 1990s. Again, we're, we're putting putting time on the scale, but it's the, it's the reality of the situation, PJ. I know. Um, 1996 was my first year here, and I started teaching current events, I think, probably 2000. So it might have been... No, it, no, it, been, it had been before, before that. Then. I was, was definitely important. a freshman in... I, mean, I could have been a sophomore, but it was, yes, it was like 97-ish. 97. 97, 98 was the first year I did that because that was 96, 97 was just American government and world geography. And why 
and how did you end up in Browerville, and where did you come from? I came from a lot of places. I was born in a little town like Browerville in southern Minnesota called Morristown. It's now part of Waterville, Lesion, Morristown. My dad was a local hero there, and I was born and raised there. And from there, we moved to Anoka because of my dad's job. So I got to see quite a bit of a shift from 19 kids in my class to 1,300 kids at Blaine Senior High. Um, then my wife got a job here in Browerville, and I just tagged along. And then uh, Browerville hired me on. I worked in Long Prairie in some non-contract jobs like homebound and subbing all the time and long-term subbing. But Browerville offered me a long-term deal, and I took it. And if I think back to that time, the, the reasons that I enjoyed your class so much is you were you were younger, I think, than maybe the average teacher at that time. You, I don't know what age you were exactly. Yeah, I was, I, you know, actually I was 25. So I was, yeah, so that's a young younger. teacher. It, by that standard, today we have a uh, elementary teacher who's 21. Huh. Teachers are hard to come by nowadays. Uh, very hard to come by. So you get them right out of college. And when there's PSEO classes, they enter college with, you know, 30 credits under their belt already and they're graduating at 21. That's, yeah, that, that is a bit of a shift. But at that time, a 25-year-old teacher was probably kind of rare. I was I was young. I was a young, new teacher, enthusiastic, full head of hair, all of that. And <laughs> you were able to relate to the kids. I, th I think younger teachers obviously understand what it's like to be a teenager better because they more recently were a teenager and understand maybe whatever is, is going on in the world slightly better than someone that might have been around for a couple extra decades. Yeah, you know, and over the years of teaching, you do get your heart broken. And, and all the jaded and miserable teachers you see, you know, the ones that are just, they're burnt out, it's because they got their heart broke somewhere in their career. Um, a kid that they really thought was something great ended up falling short of their potential and they get their heart broke. Or some administrators can crush his teacher spirit too sometimes. I, as an administrator, I, I know that's real. Um, but... Uh, as a new teacher, you're pretty young, you're naive, you're enthusiastic, you're ready to get your career started, you put in all the extra time and the effort. And um, actually, it was, I enjoyed it. And that, I still enjoyed it, and I enjoy it still today when I get to step into a classroom and take the reins. And now your title's different and has been for a while here. You are principal? I'm the principal, K-12 through the whole building, because it's a K-12 building here in Browerville. And when did that change? I knew it kind of changed a long time ago, but when did you... 2008. So you stopped teaching classes regularly. I mean, I'm sure you step in, as you said, every once in a while. But yes. for the last 11 years, you haven't been a teacher. Nope. I haven't been a teacher for 11 years. I miss it still. I still like have dreams once in a while that I'm in a classroom teaching. Um, and I loved it. It was an, It's an odd situation for me here in Browerville because I was a teacher. I was happy with my job. I love going to work every day. And the administrator, one retired, and the other one was going to slide over, which created a vacancy. And they asked me to step up and do the job for the school district. That's why I became the principal. Uh, most principals out there became principals because they want to be the boss. I had no desire to be the boss. I enjoyed my 27 by 27 kingdom. <laughs> but um, now I, I discover being the principal, now the entire building is my classroom the entire building and all the working pieces. And there's a lot of working pieces in a school, even a small one like ours, uh, to understand all of them. It, it's a new challenge. I can't sit in a room for more than 15 minutes. Otherwise, I'm scratching up my own skin and going crazy because I'm used to being fluid now. Is it more difficult to build the personal connections with some of the students since you're not spending as much time in a, a smaller space with them on any given day? Yeah, it, some students. The The thing is, I don't get to see the C student who never gets in trouble or the B student or even the A student who never gets in trouble. I get to see the D and the F, the failing, the truant, the delinquent, the ones who flip off their teacher when they get mad. Those are the kids I get to see every day. So it's a little disheartening after a while because every time a kid screws up, I do feel it a little bit. I'm soft and, and tender. My... uh other administrator here in the building is a little less soft and tender. It's good cop, bad cop. But for a good cop, it's hard when you, all you're dealing with is is consequences for kids. And you don't get to see the nuance of, of a good kid who's doing everything they should. I don't get to meet with them very often. If you can think back to your 
high school days, who do you relate to better? Are you the good kid that never got in trouble or did you have some issues that might have brought you to a to an individual that now holds your in the position that you now hold? Oh, I was never in trouble. One time I got called up to the office by uh, in Blaine and I, I for the life of me couldn't figure out why, so I just went up there kind of la di da and we had a substitute the hour before and he thought I was a different kid, and he wrote me down as absent, and I just said, well, the guy kept calling me Brandon. I'm, like, I'm not Brandon. <laughs> and then they said, well, that makes sense. That was it. That's the only time I was ever in in trouble, even close to in trouble at Blaine. Of course, to be in trouble in Blaine takes a felony of some kind. It was a pretty rough place to be sometimes. Uh, I blended pretty well. I got out of trouble with wit and kind of a sense of humor, I guess. Um no, I never really got in trouble. I was a pretty straight laced kind of kid. As we it's, we're recording this in the high school today, in one of the back rooms that I've never been in, and I haven't been around this building in a long time. Maybe here or there, just just briefly. For, I, I actually I'm not even sure the last time I was here, but I I can relate to what you just said. As as I told you, it I I don't remember ever getting in trouble, so there wasn't a lot of time for me to spend in the the back offices of the high school. No, Kurt. I think the biggest trouble you probably could have gotten into would be running the NCAA brackets and uh, some kind of gambling scheme. And if the superintendent and principal didn't buy into the brackets, they probably <laughs> would have busted you. But they bought a board and filled it out just like everybody else. So I'm not sure the superintendent and principal at that time, but maybe the current principal. I'm not, I can't quite recall. I would have. <laughs> and I still run that thing. And I think another million other people in this country run those things and I'm, I'm pretty sure if it's not technically legally okay it's still not no one no one does anything about it so no the biggest crime is that people don't work they just sit and watch the games and i'm afraid maybe that might be happening in my classroom sometimes i hope not but uh you, you probably know which classrooms to avoid so you don't have to deal with that <laughs> some and some you go there so i can see if duke is losing or not uh, so totally off topic here but now that you bring that up I've been traveling the world a fair amount the last few years, and I come to realize that other countries take more vacation time than the United States. And I have this proposal that I've not proposed to really anyone, but maybe you right now, that these days that we already know that more people than normal are unproductive, we should just make them extra holidays. So the people that want to watch college basketball, the people that want to party too hard on Super Bowl night and not go in the next day, and all these other sports-related things that tend to kind of bring out people not being very productive at work, have those as national holidays. And then for the people that don't care about sports, they get more vacation, and they're not going to care. Well, that's an interesting idea. You know, I know the United States is all about working, or it has over the last 20 years. Um, and that's part of our culture. You know, you go to Finland, and they're taking... They're taking uh, paternity and maternity leave when they have a baby. It's like four months. It's just there's no brainer. It's just what they do. France, they have like 40 days of vacation. Uh, but, you know, in the United States, we, we work still quite a bit. You know, I'm here on a Saturday. I'll be here again tomorrow and I'm here Monday through Friday. So you would have been in here sometime today anyhow, if not for just us trying to find a, a good space to do this. Yeah, I've been here for about an hour. I went down. The air compressor was stuck on down in the metal shop. So I had to go down there and turn that off. Um, you know, you just go around taking down the posters of things that have already happened. Hang up posters of the blood drive that's going on or something like that. Yeah, just taking care of business when I don't have interruptions. So those types of things, would you call them your job or is this, these are things that you're aware of that need to be done? So because you are around, you do them. Yeah, more the second. OK. More the latter than the former. Um, yeah, but, you know, that's I, there are things that I'm not great at my job all the time. So I have to excel in something. So at being taking down here, posters, okay. taking down posters, making sure things are, are working right. That I can do. So if you go in for a, a raise at some point and you can you can add that to the list of things that you do, pull down posters. I'm a terrible negotiator. <laughs> I'm terrible. I get paid less than most of the people around me, but I'm okay. But you seem to enjoy yourself. I do. If I didn't like the job, I wouldn't do it. I'd be done and go back to the classroom where I wanted. But I, I like the job now. It was hard for a few years there, especially a lateral move, going from the classroom to being the boss in the same building where your coworkers are now your subordinates. Yeah. Uh, that that's a tough that's a tough sell. That's real tough. Does that change the way that 
even though you are who you are and I, I kind of you still seem like the same person to me. Does that change the way you're, you're forced to interact with individuals because of this role or do you try to just be who you are and never let that change? You still got to be you. You can't put on a fake you. You'd be exhausted by Friday afternoon. <laughs> um, but it, it does change your relationship. Uh, this, the staff here has always been good and it, and there's always been kind of a a cohesiveness between the administration and the teachers here for years. That's kind of why they called it the magic on the hill. When I was in Long Prairie, they didn't like Browerville much because Browerville did whatever they wanted. They seemed to, you know, Prince, it just, just said it was just they did whatever they wanted. And then it was even more frustrating because they said it worked and they just called it the magic on the hill. Like I said, how how can Browerville go golfing? We still have a week of school left, and Browerville's golfing at the golf course down the road. And they, yeah. they just, like, grumble and swear a little bit, the principal down there at the time. And he just says, yeah, it's it works for him. It's magic on the hill. And, I, you know, when I got offered the job here, I was like, I want to be a part of that. <laughs> and now they were – so when I was here – the the na- one of the neighboring schools, Eagle Valley, was a big rival, and as of a number of years ago, they started to cooperate in sports. And now, recently, the school district there has dissolved, so it's there's some of those students and teachers are now here. So that's one thing that's changed drastically. But the other thing, and Bravo's always kind of been involved in some sports with Long Prairie, but now maybe a few more sports. And just recently, within the last couple of weeks of the time of this recording. If I understand it correctly, Browerville won his first ever team state championship in cooperation with Long Prairie and Gray Eagles High School. Yes. Uh, we have just one pairing with Long Prairie. We had track for a while. We had golf for a while. But there's some personality conflicts between the two schools. Um, but wrestling works. And you're not going to mess with something that's working. Uh, the boys got together and, and they created the team. I can't remember how many years ago that was, probably five years ago. And they've been very good since. Uh, we have a non-teacher who's the coach, Jake Lawrence. He lives just two blocks from the Browerville school here. His kids come to Browerville. And he started coaching. And, and this group started in the elementary. And we even had some Eagle Valley kids back then who came over to the this wrestling group. So when they got up to 7th, 8th, and now ninth and 10th grade, they're powerful. And, yeah, they went down. They took over first uh, rank number one in state in the guillotine back in December, and they never let go. And then they walked into the state tournament. I can't say they walked through it. The scores always look like that, but wrestling is kind of is kind of like that, where the scores don't really show how close it can be. But, uh, yeah, they, they dominated the teams and came back with Browerville's first team championship. We've gone to the state tournament in football. Girls basketball, volleyball, you know, all in the last 15 years, we've been to all those tournaments. This is our first championship. And I've been to a number of those since I've been living in the Twin Cities, which is six, seven years. I would pretty much any time Browerville would come to the state tournament in whatever sport, even though I barely know anyone anymore, I would show up. And maybe those are some of the times occasionally that I'd maybe cross paths with you briefly and, and say hello because I haven't seen you in a long time. But I, I do remember this of going to these state tournament games. Even though I'm optimistic because I'm naturally optimistic, we just we never win anything. Well, we're always uh, – in football, I'm going to use football as an example because we've been a football stronghold in the area and then in the conference for, I don't know, 20 years, 30 years maybe. But uh, we're never bigger than the opponent and we're rarely faster or stronger. But it's just the discipline among the kids. And it's kind of a thing about the kids. It's a culture here because when you go out for football, that's you're all in. And you do what the coaches say. And when they say start with your left foot, that's what you do. Your technique has to be perfect because that guy's bigger than you. Mm -hmm. And um, it works because we win. But once we get down to the state tournament or down uh, where outside of our conference, we run into other competition. We are now getting kids who are bigger and stronger. And they also have the technique and the discipline and the strategy. And they end up beating us. Um, We got down there and met Caledonia a couple years ago. Uh, at the U.S. Bank. In fact, we were the second game to be played on U.S. Bank Stadium. Oh. It was nine man was before us, and then it was our game. If actually, and I, if I possibly might correct you here, wasn't it Rushford Peterson? Oh, I'm sorry, Rushford Peterson down by Caledonia. Yes, yes, it was Rushford Peterson. I remember that game. I showed up to that, and that was 
unfortunately, one of the the worst. <laughs> it was a trouncing. Oh, bad. There this was one, bad. You know, and that's where we ran into guys who were bigger, faster, stronger, and they had the technique and the discipline and the strategy, and we were just beat. I mean, there's even the coach can tell you by halftime, he says, boys, we're not winning this game. He was pretty clear about that. Um, but we got to be there. And actually, it was through a lot of upsets up here in the sections that uh, that we got there. Um, we've had very talented, very strong teams. We've had teams where we were almost at the same size or maybe bigger than our opponents. But we ended up running into Monoman when they were running through their big power. Or we ran into New York Mills when they had their big team. Or we ran into Pillager when they had their big team. But we were always there. Um, and then, well, Ken, uh, not Caledonia. Rushford Peterson, they had this one guy who was, you know, a, a, he was a phenom. He was strong. He was a tremendous runner. He was disciplined. And I believe he went to Michigan State for track. So that, that's hard to beat. And that's a school that is in the state tournament basically every year. Rushford Peterson is very strong. Yeah. So, yeah, that's. But at least this time, the wrestling team was able to bring that home. So what was that like here then? What what did you do? What did this town, the, the, you know, Bravo and Long Prairie, not the same town. What did there, was there a town event and there was there a school event to celebrate or will there be still? Well, uh, they, they had afterwards and wrestling's kind of different because the team state tournament was on Thursday and then individuals were Friday and Saturday. And by Saturday night, they're exhausted and the kids are just like, no, we don't, we just go home and go to bed <laughs> and they don't want anything. Uh, when they won the section tournament in Minnewaska, uh, Browerville has started, and I'm not sure how long we've been doing it. Um, the fire trucks meet the bus at the edge of town. We escort them through town, um, and then meet up here at the school. The kids get out, the parents and everybody goes into the gym, and there's a little thing. The coach speaks, a couple of the players talk, and then they go home. But we escort the truck, you know, the the bus through town with fire trucks and the ambulance, and I get to be a part of that. I've been a part of that for quite a while, and and it's it's fun. One time, it was the girls back in, I don't remember how many years ago, they qualified for the state tournament as a team, but it was late. They were pretty far away, so it was probably 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night. It was a Tuesday night or something, too, and uh, we were driving through town with the fire trucks, and they stopped in front of the liquor store in downtown, and there was a big crowd sitting outside, so the bus stopped, and the kids could wave and all that, and the fire truck, I was in the one behind the bus, and a car was coming from the north just passing through town and they, they pulled over and rolls down the window and he says, well, what's going on here? You know, with the fire trucks and everything. I said, well, it's, it's Tuesday. <laughs> and he looked and I said, we do this every Tuesday. <laughs> rolled up his window and left. And I'm sure he's like, what morons in these small towns. <laughs> but, oh, good sense of humor. Well, it, it was fun. And the guy next to me thought it was hilarious. You know, it's Tuesday. This is what we do on Tuesdays. But uh, for a while there, you know, we went to state in basketball and football team and when the wrestling team. And, you know, we seem to be running the trucks a lot. And then when we paired with Eagle Valley, we inherited a speech program. We inherited uh, a one-act play program that uh, this, the year that we had the girls going to the state tournament, the boys going to the state tournament in basketball, the one-act play went down to the state competition and won that. So then we had fire trucks coming up. For you know, we we said we do it for sports, we do it for our arts, of course, yeah. we do it for everything except for FFA. If you you know win the poultry judging, you, we don't run the trucks. <laughs> um, but you know, we run the trucks for those guys too. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I, didn't, I haven't been around here for those things in a while, but of course, I've I've seen the the whole town basically shut down to go go to the state tournament events uh, on, on a lot of occasions, which is always. Pretty neat to see the the support in this city, especially, and and that maybe big cities they do do that a little bit too, like and the big and similar amount of people, but here it's it's really it's really everybody seems to get behind it. It's it's mean it's a town identity, I suppose, in some ways. It's it's nice, and in my you know in this town in particular, the the community and the school really meld together well. The school com- supports the community whenever it can. Uh, that those are in little things that people just don't see when the city's doing its big city project. They need the school to take care of something goes out of our way and it's an expense but the school says we're going to do it for the city um the superintendent gritted his teeth i said we got to do this because the city supports us we got to support the city and, and they go back and forth very well together the community has been very supportive of the, the the city i was talking to a neighboring school 
a board member from a neighboring school district a few years ago, and he said he, you know, as much as they hate Browerville, and he said they hate Browerville, but it's because when they drive through here on a Friday, you walk downtown and people are wearing orange and black, the school colors. The, the, the people do. They're just, you know, going about their business, but they don the orange and black. He says the community loves a school and the school the community. It's, you can't make that happen. It's just wonderful that it does, and we just maintain that relationship. You came in here for, as an outsider, however many years ago that was. Now, at what point did you, assuming you've kind of decided this, that you decided this this would be your home long term and you would be a part of this community until you're, maybe you're, you're done with your working years? Yeah, it was 23 years ago we moved here. Um, you know, when I first started here, it was a stepping stone. We're going to move on. But this is the best place to raise a kid, is this, is this little community or a little – Towns all around, you know. This is a nice place. It's very Norman Rockwell esque. It's got some Mayberry appeal to it. <laughs> uh, you know, we're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a nice place to raise kids. So it was about, oh, uh, probably about ninety nine. After a couple years here at the school, I said this is a nice place to go. It's a nice place to have kids. Bought a little house right on Main Street. You know, living that uh, dream, I guess. And you moved here. You were, well, how many kids in your family? I have three. And you and how many siblings? I had six siblings. There were seven of us. I'm the oldest. And then it was uh, Jolene, Bernadette, Brian, Benjamin, Derek, and James. So you had a big family, and I guess the younger ones. How many was it? Was it Derek? Anyone else came to school here? Ben started here. That's right. In 90, he That's graduated right. in 2000. Um, my older, the brother older than Ben. Brian, they called him Fuzz. He was very popular in Princeton. That's where we were at that time. Uh, homecoming King, starting running back in the state tournament football team, starting defenseman in the state hockey ranked team. And, you know, he was he was a local hero down there. And Ben was very quiet. He lived in the shadow of Fuzz and, you know, by no fault of Fuzz, but Ben seemed to get lost. And, you know, we had a house. I had an empty bedroom. I said, you know, Ben, you can come up here and try a small town. And he really, uh, he really enjoyed it, and he flourished. He went out for choir, mostly because of two girls. <laughs> but um, he went out for choir. He enjoyed that. He went out for um, theater, the one-act play we had back then. He went out for football. He never would have in Princeton, but he went out for football. You know, he did these things. So Ben started here. Then my family moved up from Princeton to find some stability because my dad had a stroke. He was 39 when he had his first stroke and he couldn't work anymore. Um, so then they were just looking for some place to go and they brought Ben and Derek and James. And it was, I believe in your current events class in my freshman year of high school where I first met Derek when he came to this town. And I was maybe his first, one of his first good friends in this town and so I suppose I guess we'd have been in school together for about I guess, probably it was four years, and mm. I don't know we were always friends. I don't know if I was one of his closest friends by the time we departed here. But then, as I guess we get to a, a sad moment of this, thinking back on my life, he he died at a young age a couple of years after that. Yeah, he died at twenty four. He you know Derek was a bit of an outlaw. I mean, if you knew Derek, you knew he was an outlaw. But at, at, he was kind. I can say that, you know, he didn't always follow the rules. I remember going out to my mom and dad's house and going toe-to-toe with my brothers, Derek and James mostly, for some of the stupid things they do in the school that I'm working in. (laughs) Yeah, so it it made for some awkward family moments there. But um, in hindsight, you know, we have another guy named Dennis, special needs guy who lives right up the road, and he still talks about how Derek was always nice to him. And other people weren't nice to him, but Derek was nice. So I'm... Relieved to think that, granted, he was an outlaw and he drove me crazy when he was here and he did things I wouldn't approve of, I suppose. But he was kind. He was. And I tell you, when when all is said and done, if people can say that after you're gone, you've had a pretty good life. And how's how's family life now, I guess, if if you want to talk about it a little bit. I, I, I've met a number of your family, I think, because of, you know, Derek's funeral and then i know your, your i think your dad passed away a couple of years or not too long after that and I, I was around your family uh a, a fair amount back in the day but now i haven't i haven't been around anyone in a long time oh the family's all right you know when derek died my my father was diagnosed with cancer in the fall and um 
in the fall of 2006. So you're going through the grieving process. It was a late stage cancer, and, and he had the strokes when he was 39. So he had a lot of health problems, uh, and he was only 57 at the time. And uh, so we're going through the grief process and in that process of accepting mortality with your father. Um, and then on Christmas Eve, 2006, it was about 11.30, Derek just tipped over in a chair. And they started CPR, and uh, people came in from all around in Faribault. Uh, sheriff's deputies, off-duty, everybody came in to try to help. They only lived uh, 100 yards from the emergency room at the hospital, but um, it it was too late. They said nothing they could do would have saved him. Uh, so Derek died on Christmas Eve, ruined Christmas for a while. And then my father was just crushed, and nine weeks later he died. Mm. So, yeah, the family took kind of a hard, hard hit. Um, and then, you know, dad's gone. Mom is doing okay. She's in assisted living in Northfield. Uh, when Derek died, and when you lose a child, it changes you, and it changed her. And then, of course, Dad dying nine weeks later just didn't help anything at all. So Mom's in assisted living in, in uh, Northfield. My brother's in Northfield, Ben. He's a prison guard. Uh, my other brother, or my sister, Bernadette, is also in Northfield. So they're, they're down there, and they're pretty close to each other. But, you know, they all have kids now, too. I, I'm kind of sad we're not as close as we used to be, you know, seeing each other all the time. But that's because they have kids and they're creating their own tight nucleus. So, you know, I did the same thing. I have a boy who's 25, a girl who's 21, and another boy who's 17. So, you know, I know what it's like to be running around and doing stuff with them. And you just don't have the time to drive to Northfield or Rogers or St. Michael all the time. Well, you're, I, I, didn't, I hadn't thought about what age your kids might be. So you're getting close to the time of your life where... You're not going to have any children living in the home. At least, I guess I don't know where, where they all live. But at some point here, you're going to have the, a little more freedom, perhaps. Yeah, I You guess. and your wife to do, do different things with your time. Empty nest syndrome, they call it. Uh, the, the oldest boy, 25, he's in the Army. He's uh, Army National Guard, but he's full-time. And he's shipping out. So he doesn't have his own apartment. He's going to wait until he ships out. And then when he comes back, he'll buy a place. But he's stationed or he goes to work every day at Camp Ripley. And he's a lieutenant. Uh, so he's an officer. He's kind of a career guy. Uh, my daughter's in Bemidji. She's graduating this spring, and she has no idea what she's going to do, but she wants to stay in Bemidji. She likes it there. And then Christian James, my youngest, he's going to Bemidji next fall. So that's about when we'll be empty. I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. But I, I stay busy. You know, I'm I'm the fire chief here in town, and uh, I'm helping run the ambulance crew as well with the ambulance, uh, which are two different departments. So all that stuff keeps me busy. Yeah, that, that does sound very busy. So you're the principal of the high school and the fire chief of the fire department. And the fire department, for, for the people that are listening that aren't from a small town and don't have much to do with a small town, it's probably a lot different than a big city fire department. Yeah. Uh, fire department here is volunteer. So we have teachers and principal and we have shop owners and mechanics and bankers and stuff like that. I mean, it's all walks of life. And that's what you are. You're a you run a mechanic shop or something, you're an auto body place. But when the pager goes off, suddenly you become a fireman. Mm -hmm. And you have to run down to the hall and, and jump in a truck. And we get called out to all kinds of things. You know, in large cities, departments, you are specialized. You do entry or you run the pumper or you drive a tanker or, you know, you have a job to do. Maybe another job, but that's about it. Here, when the fire pager goes off, it, we get called from soup to nuts. Missing person, we got to walk through a swamp looking for somebody or something's on fire. Big structure's on fire. We've had three aircraft accidents in my time on the fire department within our, our district. We've had uh, the Lando Lakes plant exploded on Thanksgiving a few years ago. I mean, it's just all kinds of things. Then do you find yourself in situations where you are addressing something kind of important at the school and then something slightly more urgent happens where you need to just put whatever you're doing here aside and, and leave? Sometimes. Uh, the superintendent, the school district, again, the, the school and this community really blend together. The district has an understanding that if something goes on that requires me to leave here, I will leave. If, um, if it's something that, say it's a medical lift assist, they're going to go help the ambulance lift, we have other guys who can do that who aren't at work. But um, if there's CPR in progress or something is pretty big, the district has agreed to let me go. And uh, another teacher we have can also go on these fire calls. 
because, you know, the board said one of these days it might be my house. So, you know, they did the two work together. I made a note here before talking to you. The last time I saw you in person, I'm not exactly sure. The last time I saw images of you were about a year ago. The Super Bowl was in Minnesota. And oh. somehow, for some reason, well, yeah, maybe you can explain it a little bit. Is you made you made the Twin Cities news because the Super Bowl was in Minnesota, and explain how that all came about and why why you ended up being the person I saw on TV. The AFC Championship game, um, New England Patriots win it, and of course the crowds filled with or the the fields filled with the press and the players and and all the celebrating and confetti and all that stuff. And of course the microphone goes in front of Tom Brady's face, and they say, you know, what do you think about? Going to Minnesota, we're hosting the Super Bowl here in Minnesota at uh, U.S. Bank Stadium. What do you think about going to Minnesota to play in the Super Bowl? And he says, you know, I'm very comfortable in Minnesota. And you win the AFC Championship game. The Super Bowl is coming up. And the star quarterback, Tom Brady, says, Browerville, Minnesota. And you know there's, there's sports people all over the place. They're Googling where Browerville, Minnesota is. So... That, that opened up this floodgate. I remember getting somebody sent me a text message saying, and I didn't even see the game. Oddly enough, I think I was on a medical with the ambulance. So I get back and I get a text message, something about, you know, Tom Brady said Browerville. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's kind of neat, I guess. But Monday morning when I came into school, <laughs> we had uh, the LA Times sports guy and New York Times sports and ESPN and Fox Sports Net and just everybody. Ended up uh, on my answering machine. Why you, though? I mean, I guess maybe you, but... The principal. Principal I mean, of the just, high school of the time. It's just yeah. who they call. Well, the, they, they called the, the building the switchboard. And then, of course, Stacia, who's our, our switchboard operator, sent them all to me saying, I, I'm not sure what you're going to do with these. <laughs> do with what? Well, I'll listen. And then after I did that, then I went back and, and tried to watch where he said Browerville. And he talked about his grandparents. His grandmother... Uh, is from Browerville. Um, she was a homecoming queen. His his mother. I mean, I'm sorry, his mother. Yes, yes. his mother. I said grandmother. I suppose grandma was too. But his mother was from Browerville and homecoming queen, and she does have a resemblance. And uh, so that opened up this floodgate. And, and just the logic of it all, because the AFC game was won, New, New England Patriots are playing. And so they they end up coming here. The press starts coming to Minnesota, and they do some of the pregame stuff. But they've got a two-day time period where they don't have anything to do. So they Google up where Browerville is, jump in their cars, and they drive up here. And every office here was filled with, I think ESPN was in this room we're in right now. My office had Sports Illustrated. Uh, the superintendent's office had the, the LA Times guy. Uh, the athletic director's office had somebody uh, someplace out of um, Fargo. WDAY, I think, came down here with their camera crew. And they were out interviewing people on the street, and they're taking you know camera shots. But we pulled out the yearbook. We keep all yearbooks. It's a yep. historical document. We pulled out the yearbook that has the homecoming queen picture of uh, Tom Brady's mom. And that became like gold. Everybody wanted a piece of that action. So we had that out on the front. So when people came in, so, well, you can take this picture here. And sometimes they would interview people. And, yeah, it was, uh, you know, schools never want to be in the news. You, you just don't because it's generally bad. Yeah. So if we're going to be in the news, it's awesome that it was something like this. And then I, I don't know, I might have said something stupid like, you know, you put a helmet on this lady and she's going to look just like him. And I was <laughs> like, oh, great, I'm going to have Tom Brady or some of his mooks come down and just beat the crap out of me. Did that never happen, though? No. <laughs> I was waiting for offensive linemen to come in here. And, you know what? You uh, bad mouth. See, if, if you're trying to be funny in every situation, I guess sometimes you're forced to say something that maybe you shouldn't have Might said. Maybe stupid. <laughs> maybe stupid. But, you know, it was, it was very, it was fun. It was exciting. Uh, the kids get to see ESPN. They wear the like, ESPN logo on there. And, and after a while, the kids realize what's going on. It was, it was fun. It was kind of neat to be in the, in the spotlight for something kind of trivial and kind of fun. But for Monday and Tuesday, because Monday night they had the press thing where they got to interview all the players. So between Sunday and Monday... We had the circus here for a while, and it, it was fun, but I was kind of glad it was over by Tuesday. Which, of course, all of us from here, living here, know know that story that his mom's from here, and a lot of the extended family still live here. 
Mm-hmm. And that was, what, Super Bowl six or seven for Tom Brady, and they just won it again this year. But suddenly, after all these years of Tom Brady being best quarterback in football, Super Bowl champion, Super Bowl every few years, or, you know, a frequent Super Bowl participant, you know, suddenly that happened here, which was, I suppose, just the coincidence of the game being in, in this in this state. Yeah, that was a coincidence. I was actually kind of hoping the Vikings would have been there. To yeah, play me too. too. But, you know, if, I remember when Tom Brady played for, I think it was Michigan. Yes. He was Mich- Michigan. And I remember talking to some of their relatives are here and they said, well, we're going to go down and watch Michigan play the Gophers because our cousin plays. And I thought that was pretty amazing. Hey, your yeah. cousin plays for Michigan. Well, then. You know, that was just a stepping stone. Long before he, maybe before he even played a game in the NFL, it was the front page of the Browerville Blade, which I'm not even, does that that exist anymore? The hometown newspaper did it combined with like kind of an area. They've combined with the Independent News Herald out of Clarissa. One of the, the the first, the first time I ever heard of him was front story Browerville Blade before he'd ever accomplished anything, like anything on a national scale. Yeah. You know, and and to play football at, at Michigan, to be a quarterback in Michigan is huge. I mean, that right now, you know, you look at Tom Brady and he's got a handful of rings and stuff. But to be a quarterback in Michigan or any Big Ten school is is really quite something. You have to be something special to be able to play that position there. So, I mean, when I heard he played at Michigan, I thought that's pretty impressive, you know. And then, of course, the draft. And, and I don't think he was even drafted very high. He wasn't Johnny Big Money Manziel, you know, with all the promise. No, yeah, he was, he was later on pick, kind of an afterthought. I think, you know, I think he was very fortunate to get into um, the New England Patriots somehow or other. And I don't know. And what we see on TV is what they project. It's their image. Something in that organization wins. Mm-hmm. Something there is winning from top down. Something there. Their organization is a winning organization. Um, there, there are those organizations, they win something about it. I'm, I'm hoping it's top down. I imagine that's what it is because I'm on top here and I'm hoping I can do that for our school, but there are those schools, even in small towns, they're always winning. People hate them and it just fuels the fire. Edina, you know, the old store, the old saying state hockey tournament just happened where out state, they hate the Metro and the Metro hate the privates and everybody hates Edina, but they win. Mm-hmm. They're always winning. There's something there, something about it. St. Michael Albertville is kind of becoming that way too. There's a state football tournament, state wrestling tournament, um, everything. Um, there, there are those schools. Miniota is one of those. Girls basketball is down state tournament. Boys basketball, their wrestling program, although they didn't get the state tournament, they were ranked most of the year. They're very good. They beat us in the state tournament for football recently. There are those schools. They have a culture of winning. They have a culture of success. And I think it's not just high schools, because I can see that in the pros. Um, Aaron Rodgers is, is great and all that, but would he have been great if he was the quarterback in Minnesota in that organization? Was it Aaron Rodgers, or was it the organization that he got to be in that created him? Hard to say. And we can never know how it could go a different way, but I think you bring up a good, really good point of the structure, the, the people around you, have, have these influences on on us as individuals in in ways that maybe we we don't even recognize but it's so important to have people around you that really know what they're doing and want the best for you and are able to get it out of you because I think that us as individuals we can't do that much on our own knowing that we need these influences to continue to inspire us and and help us to to make the most of, of what we're doing at least that's what I'm, I'm trying to kind of figure out as, as my life goes on. I, I think I've got a lot of things figured out, but I always need I need the right people kind of saying the right things at the right time to really in, help me get the most out of myself. You need you are as good as the people as you surround yourself with. I mean that's that's kind of a political thing. Um, I met Amy Klobuchar last spring, about a year ago, and you know the senator is a senator and you, and I taught government and all that, but what you don't see is that Amy Klobuchar at the top, this, just her office has 25 people and she tries and, and when they get elected, they go down there and they try to surround themselves with the people who are the best at their job. Amy Klobuchar is a Democrat and of course she's running for president. But if you've got a Republican legislative assistant, but they're a rock star, I don't care. You're a rock star. I want you working for me. You know, and they're jockeying for all these people when you get in there. Um, so you are as good as the people that 
that you surround yourself with. And that was kind of what she said. So I'm working hard to get the best people around me so I can do the best job I can. And that's that's the case just about anywhere, socially. Uh, if you're any endeavor you have, in a public school, my job is to get the best teachers I can. I don't, uh, we, we advertise like everybody else, but I've kind of taken the offensive. I'm out recruiting. I'm calling up somebody saying, hey, we've got a really nice school here. You're very good at your job. We want you here. So far, it's worked out pretty well. And if I can think back to my days in school, both in high school and then at, well, briefly at Alexandria Technical College and then St. Cloud State University where I got my uh, my degree as a mass com major. And, and you had mentioned, I think before we started recording, that you were a mass com major br- briefly a couple of years before getting an education. During my educational days, like it's so easy to see, look back now and see how I, I wish things kind of were different so I could have done more, been better. I don't remember either from my family or necessarily from the school, really being pushed in a way that I, I, I now think, I bet if someone would have pushed me a little bit differently, I could have gotten a lot more out of myself. I mean, I, I did well. I was an A student. It came pretty easy, which I think was part of the problem. That is a problem. We have A students. Um, this is like a natural athlete who goes into high school sports, and they get to coast on their natural athleticism. But once you enter into the next level, say you want to play in a college level, uh, you have all kinds of other natural athletes. Now it's the ones who work hard, the ones who just they have to grit and and fight through everything. Those are the ones who are successful. The difference between somebody who's a success and somebody who's a failure as far as physical ability goes isn't very big. It's that little twist in their head that keeps them from losing. They hate losing. They always want to win. They want to be successful. And that is the difference. And, you know, it's hard to do this in schools. You know, public schools are really, we can't really push kids very hard because parents come after you like a ton of bricks. It it gets hard. I believe it. The thing that I, I realize later is I was just trying to get A's and I got A's. So I thought I was doing good, which to me is totally backwards from what, and I should have been learn as much as you can learn, find ways to enjoy learning, learn whatever it is you like learning about and continue to learn with that. You're probably gonna get some A's, maybe some B's, maybe some C's somewhere, but it's way more valuable to your life to just have this desire to soak in as much information as possible and keep it in your mind and not just dump it off because you just passed the test. Well, that's something we usually get about 23 years old. Yeah. 16 well, year olds. They don't see it that way. No. Um, yeah. Do you take, you say you have two student, or two teachers, both teach English 9 or English 10. Um, one is hard, has very high expectations, but the best you're probably going to get is a B. The other one, you're going to get an A. But you're not going to get pushed as hard. Mm-hmm. Which one, which classroom is filled? Yeah. Oh, and why is that? That's part of the problem. And that, that is a problem. And you try to tell kids, you've, and, and they fight. They fight tooth and nail so they can get the A. They want the 3.8 GPA. Frankly, you know, and I have a kid who's graduating now, and I think his grade point average is pretty good. I really don't even know. Um, but he's pretty he's pretty bright. Um, he got, a, I think he got a 28 on the ACT, which is not nationally renowned, but it's pretty good. He's learned a lot. He's pretty good at what he's doing. My guess, or my hope for him is that he learns resilience. Take the C. And, you know, and hate it, I suppose, but learn and be humble a little bit. Straight A kids are great, but I don't know if I would hire a straight A 4.0 social studies teacher because he's going to be teaching kids he can't, he can't understand because they're not 4.0 kids. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's a lot more to be learned than just worrying about your grade, um, but I, I see resilience as kind of a, a thing that I really fear kids aren't getting anymore. They don't learn how to be resilient. They don't learn how to overcome obstacles very well. You mentioned public school. You're kind of restricted in some ways of how you're going to be able to do things. The, the structure of the American education system kind of is what it is. There are some independent type of schools doing some things differently. If you could make some changes to the public school system that you're really, even as principal of a school, you're not in a position to make right now. What were what are some things you'd like to see from public schools sometime down the road when we're able to make some of these changes? Uh, 
you know, great, great inflation is a thing. Uh, it'd be nice to be rid of great inflation or, or just restructure grading. We're an A, you know, A, B, C, D. There are other things. There's standard-based grading that's out there. It's getting a lot of traction now. But the big problem with standard-based grading is that the parents and the stakeholders, the board members, um, employers and colleges, if you go standard-based grading, they accomplished all the standards, everything they need to learn. They've learned in, co- in uh, high school all the math standards, all the science standards. They've exceeded them. They've taken their standardized tests and they've exceeded them. And they walk into college or an employer or their parents. They look at the report card and it says they've met all the standards and they've exceeded them. The parents are still scratching their head and they say, so what is that, a 3.9 GPA? Are, are these all A's? They, the, the people who are, are stakeholders and the ones who hold schools accountable aren't accepting something other than the standard grading scale. So that, that makes it very hard to change. And honestly, you know, public schools are, are constantly in motion. So we can't just stop time to make a change, then run it and see if it works or not. Um, it's like trying to change the spark plugs in my Dodge while we're cruising down the freeway. This thing's still moving because that little 10-year-old is going to be a fifth grader only one time. Mm-hmm. You can't screw that up. So if we try to do something and it screws up, that's his 10th grade, or that's his 10-year-old year. He's not going to be 10 next year, so we can try it again. So that that's what holds things back a little bit as far as changes in education because we can't, you know, we can't sacrifice or risk somebody's fifth grade year to try something if it doesn't work. And it's probably not going to work if you're not going to get buy-in from the stakeholders, from board members, from employers, from colleges. And they've tried to, they've tried uh, weighted GPAs. They probably started them about when you were in high school. We didn't. But some schools started if you take an AP class or a college class in high school, that should be worth more than a 4.0. That should be a 4.3. So we considered that uh, about three years ago. I started looking into offering a higher GPA for grades. If you took college classes in high school, you should get more than if you took a non-college class, a high school level class. Because conceivably, the the college class is harder. So they should get more than an A in a general ed high school class. So we looked at doing a 4.3 GPA. And I called other schools and see what they use. One school used a 4.5. Another one used 4.2. All things being equal, one kid has a 4.5 and the other one's got a 4.2. And one school out farther west had 5. And then I called colleges and said, what do you do with weighted grades? And they said, we don't deal with them. So if you send me a transcript and it's got a weighted grade system on it, we're going to tell you to recalculate this with a 4.0 general GPA because we don't want to see somebody's weighted GPA. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that, then I thought, you know, the people who really want to see this, they don't want to see anything outside of the norm, 4.0. That's what colleges want. That's what employers want when they're hiring somebody and they want to see a GPA. They don't want to see an an inflated GPA that they don't understand. They want to see a 4.0. They like their pastry chef's French. (laughs) Some things, you know, they just, we can change things in the school, but it's the outside forces, the stakeholders, the employers, the colleges, the board members, the parents, they have to accept these changes before the school can really make them in earnest. You're part of such a large structure that to change something here will probably just cause more problems than than do good yeah and you don't mess with mama bears you know her 11th grade kids gpa if we changed it to a series of i don't know numbers or letters instead of numbers and they're gonna be like no don't do that you i want to see what they get a is that a minus what is that and you just say no they took all the science standards and they exceeded all of them so what what is that is that an a then <laughs> you know that's what you're gonna get mm-hmm Change is hard. You're getting to an age when you're discovering change is hard. The older you get, the less you like change. I don't know that anyone likes change. In a recent episode, my guest and I talked about that. I, I've learned, though, that there's, like, you know, whatever I am right now, the only way I can make it better is to change whatever there is. <laughs> I mean, change doesn't mean your life's going to get worse. I mean, in some cases, maybe. But I think being being willing to to adjust something, do something different, is, and consider that maybe there's a better way of doing something allows your life to improve, I find. 
It does, but it's scary. And like now I'm almost 50. Things I've noticed about change is that uh, I generally don't initiate these changes. They are thrust upon me. Mm -hmm. Um, My family changed in 2006 when my brother died. Not really a good change in my mind. No. In hindsight, you know, we all die. It's just a matter of time. He happened to die much earlier than I would have liked. But it was a change. We grow from it. We learn from it. There's nothing we can do to change that. And there's nothing we can do to reverse it. So, you know, as I'm getting older, a lot of these changes are not initiated by me. They're kind of thrust upon me, which makes them less less appealing. So I guess that's why I don't like change so much. I have uh, one one thing that I... A note that my sister had mentioned to me when I told her I was coming up up here to talk to you. Uh, a memory that she had remembered. And I, I remember it once she said it. I remember the, the maybe the one time we kind of hung out somewhere was at her. She, I think she, it was her going away party. Yes. About, about 10 years ago at my parents' place where they used to live. And she says, and now I think this is true, that we must have done battle in a game of beer pong that yes. day. I, I did pretty well at first. I suppose that's the nature of beer pong, isn't it? At first, you do pretty well. Yeah. And then then you don't. I did, I, I, you know, I've never played before, so I had beginner's luck on my side. That but, wasn't a thing that was going on at Bemidji State back in the day? No, that didn't happen. I, I think it kind of came about when my, right around my college years, that, yeah. that was the thing. We had other dumb things we did, you know, at Bemidji State in 1980s and early 90s. But beer pong was not one of them. I don't know, maybe I'd have been better at it if, if I had practiced more, but. I, that day, it was, I think my friend Chris and I, we were playing, and we'd played a fair amount, and everyone else that we played against hadn't played much. We kept winning, which is a problem then in that game. You end up winning, you end up playing too long, and then, you know, yeah. the, night, the night turns. Well, losing isn't very fun either. <laughs> it's now time for my Being Wrong segment, and I ask all of my guests... If they can think back on their life, something they've started doing differently, thinking about differently, what can you now, PJ Sutliff, say that you were wrong about? Oh, I'm wrong so often. Everybody's wrong once in a while. Um, things I've been wrong about in the past, pretty much how you know how I did my job, uh, that I've, and how I approach students, and and what I thought students should their goals should be, that was wrong. I would. You know, I always said you should prepare yourself for college. No, college is not for everybody. College is for some because we do need people to be in the professions that required four-year degrees, but we also need people in the professions that require some training, a diesel mechanic or a mechanic, auto body guy, electricians. It was wrong to say that everybody should get to college and be successful. Um, If I could go back in time, ultimately the goal for everybody is happiness, that you're doing what you would like to do that you're happy. When I was teaching in the classroom, my happiness was teaching, but that wouldn't be the happiness for everybody there. It shouldn't be the happiness for everybody there. Um, I know I had mechanics in there. I know I've had, gosh, I have a lawyer now that I talk to on occasion on the professional side of things. And she was in my classroom. So that's kind of sad, actually. She became a lawyer. <laughs> so I was wrong there. Um, yeah, just how you guide students. You know, I always thought, behaviorism, consequences, and punishment. That's not really a very good way to go about things. Um, I like it here, but I might be changing where I live here in a few years. You never know. So you're, you're never set in your ways then? Oh, I'm set in my ways. There's no doubt. I've lived here for 20-some years. You know, I'm, I like going into a store and knowing everybody, or pretty much everybody that's there, uh, having a standing order at the, down, the downtown conference center i walk in i said give me their usual i can actually go in and say i would like the usual and they know what it is that's kind of fun but um i agreed to take the principal job because i could feel myself getting a little tired teaching uh, doing the same thing american government and the chapters i really loved it and i you know i did kind of try to keep up with things but Coming up to the office was a change, 
and I miss teaching. And I, and when I retire, I'll probably go back and teach part time. Just I'll walk in and say, "Hey, uh, pay me the the least amount you legally can. I just want to do this." Um. So, yeah, going through change. I mean, you talked about change in your earlier podcast. You said you you resist it, but you crave it at the same time. Kind of like a like a thirteen year old resists consequences and boundaries yet they crave them and need them and they they really truly want them they just it's hard for them to accept it that's where i am now i'm gonna finish my doctorate at uh st cloud state university this fall I believe. oh really yes uh, i'm just finishing up chapter in fact just before i got here i'm working on chapter four of my dissertation uh and i'll start chapter five here next week so hopefully knock on wood that's a bugger but I'm um, hoping to finish up my doctorate and be done by November next year. And then that I don't know why. I don't have any goals in mind, but I'm beginning to open my mind up to the possibility of doing something else, which is absolutely wild change for me. I thought I was going to stay here and retire and, and grow old and and all that. But yeah, the possibility is there that I would go someplace else. So you had to get a master's to even have the, your current job. But so then at some point you you decided you felt compelled to keep on going in education to this moment, which you just described that you're not even sure what I'm not why even, or what you're gonna do with it. Yeah. Um you know, to, I got my master's just so I could be a better teacher. And then when I was offered the principal job, then I went back to school for two more years to get my principal's license which is another, you get your master's and it's two more years of school for your principals called a sixth year license, I think, or seventh year license. Um, and then that would be the beginning part of a doctorate if you wanted to do that. And it was kind of like, uh, you know, if you've got gold status and, and you're great and you think that's the best at the club, you know, I've got gold status at the club. And then you find out there's something called a platinum status. You're like, I want, I want that. And I don't know what it is, but I want that. <laughs> And then you get the platinum status and you hear that there's something called a double platinum status. And you're like, oh, I, I want that. Um, when I got my master's. That was nice and all. And then I got the whatever the principal license is, a six-year license. And then just that last thing. Because there's nothing beyond doctorate. That's it. So I thought, well, I, I want that now. Just that next step. Now I, I don't even want it for anything just to, just to complete it. I've never not started. How does this work? I've never started something and not finished it. I've never, you know, EMT class. Of all the classes I've taken, I'm, you know, I'm working on my doctorate, but of all the classes I've taken, that EMT class was the hardest. That was brutal. The test was just, it, it hurt my head. Um, and it was high stakes, you know. Much as we bash high stakes tests, they're reality. There's, there's the medical boards, there's nursing boards, there's EMT. That's a hard test. When I took that test, I was determined I'm going to finish this thing, you know, a couple of swear words in there, I suppose, <laughs> but I'm going to finish this thing. And, and fortunately, I, I was fortunate enough to be able to do that. And so now this doctorate, now that I've started it, I've got to finish this thing. It's hard because, you know, ambulance, fire, kids in school and, and being the principal here, it's hard to find the time for it, but, uh. Yeah, now it's just personal drive to finish this darn thing. But once I get that, I imagine there will be doors that I don't even know exist that might open up, mm -hmm. which means that I have to open my mind to the possibility of leaving my comfort zone a little bit. That's where you grow. You don't grow outside of or within your comfort zone. I don't think you can really grow that much. That's what I found. No, I mean, it's a comfort zone and I'll fight tooth and nail to stay there because it's comfortable. Mm -hmm. Just like laying in bed in the morning. It's comfortable. <laughs> but nothing gets accomplished if you don't get up yeah. and, and get out there. So, you know, right now I'm comfortable. And it's that's just fine. My last student is, my last kiddo is graduating from high school. So the comfort zone is a very good place to be. While he has a stable home, he knows that I'm there. He knows that mom's there. He knows that this is his school. This is his hometown. Um, you know, moving around a lot, I never had hometown. I can't look back and say, you know, I said I was born and raised in Morristown, but then I moved to Anoka, and then from there we moved to Princeton, and one t for one year we were in Illinois. So I can't say that's my hometown, you know. I graduated from Princeton, but I only went to school there for nine months. I went to Anoka 
my freshman year, I was at Blaine, my sophomore and junior year. I, I bounced around a lot, so I wanted to be sure that my kids have a hometown. They have their home school. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and you get to come back to your old school and talk about, you know, when you went to school. I don't get to do that. I went to Blaine for a couple of years. I was at Anoka for a year. I was in Morristown until fourth grade, you know, so that's something I wanted to produce for somebody else. This brings some more thoughts to my mind, so I'm going to keep the conversation going longer. Than normally, when I get to the being wrong segment, it's guesses something that they're wrong about, and then oh. that's it, which is it's okay that this isn't going that way exactly. But now I wonder, you mentioned all these different schools. Like, I can come back here, and I think my favorite teacher, it's PJ Sutliff, and he happens to still be here, so I know where to find him. Do yeah. you think back to your life and think of a favorite teacher, someone that you thought, I just really enjoyed this class, this teacher, and that helped me in some way. That, that's weird because, uh, you know, going through the education process, going into your master's and, and all that stuff, one of the things they always ask you to is to reflect on, on the strengths of your favorite teacher. Honestly, I don't have a favorite teacher. I had a lot of teachers, um, you know, in various places. I had a coach. One of my favorite coaches was a, uh, as a person, he wasn't the greatest person, but as a coach, he was phenomenal. Um the things he personally accomplished gave him credibility. So when he said something, you're like, yeah, yeah, well, you know, you were a Big Ten champion for four years, so I guess maybe you do know what you're talking about. Um, so, you know, I had little aspects of all these different teachers that I really liked, but none, that no individual teacher stood out for me. Uh, I had a Spanish teacher who was consistent Every day he started with the same, as Spanish classes are, started the same, you know, routine. I love that about him. Uh, I had another teacher who had a very strong personal relationship, very smiley, happy all the time. Um, I love that about her. So there's different things about different teachers I remember. And there's things that I did not like about some teachers. And I guess maybe the the collective unit, the... Um, platonic ideal if you understand plato's philosophy of ideals it's the ideal chair has all elements of chair just in the ideal of mm -hmm. chair but no physical chair can embody all of those ideals uh, my platonic ideal of an ideal teacher is a combination of mr cry's spanish class and miss k's spanish class and mr gabrielson's social studies class and uh my college prep history class teacher mr Dahl down in blaine and Mr. Lehman, my fourth grade teacher, all of those positive qualities embody in my ideal. So I guess I had a ideal teacher, but it's not a physical body. It's a collection of them. And my least favorite, but I prefer to look at the good ones. Yes. So then your classroom, did it become these things? Were you able to actually bring that together? Was it as realistic as you had hoped it might be? Some of them. Mr. Dahl always carried a stick, a, a plastic baseball bat. He used it as a pointer, and then he just kind of bang it around stuff. And I don't know if it was for your class, but I later on started stealing a yardstick from Rigstead, our, our math teacher. And then uh, so I banged stuff around, and I used it as a pointer, and it was, and I kind of remember Mr. Dahl. That's what he did. And then the little fun things that Dahl did, that uh, Miss K did, I had a, one of the big puppet monkeys, and I called him my geography monkey, and and. For one day, I would have my geography monkey teach the class. Stupid. But it's different. It brings life to the class. Social studies is boring. Oh, everybody knows it. That's one of the nice things about teaching social studies is I can't assume anybody here likes this <laughs> because they don't. They will like history after they've lived long enough to see how history is created. When you're 17, you're living for today. You're living for tomorrow. You're not really looking back and seeing how your life is part of the timeline of history. Once you hit your 20s and 30s, you look back and see how history is formed and how you are a part of it and how you see it. Then it becomes real. And then you look back and say, I wish I paid more attention in history. It's like, well, you're horned up and 16 years old. You're not thinking anything history when you're in my class. You know? Oh, that's funny. That's, that's it's the, true. It, it's brutal. And it's, I've always known from that because I was bored in history class. I hated history class. I was much more interested in the blonde who was next to me. And if she liked history, well, I like history. <laughs> That's kind of how it was. And I knew that. And going into the classroom teaching it, I knew people don't enjoy history yet. 
you have to lay a foundation down. So when they start seeing how history is formed, then they can go back and, and touch and start connecting some of the things that they learned in class and seeing how they work together. And then, then they can start creating their own fabric of history, or at least in their mind. That was part of teaching history. Nobody liked government. Nobody still likes government. So there's no way to make that fun. Just know that going into it. But I think you're, you, you, you do make things fun. You made, yeah, I guess that's, it was fun to be in your class, even though no matter what we were learning about, wasn't necessarily fun on its own. That's why I liked it. It was fun to show up to school, to go to that class and look forward to it every day, which is, I think, if you have that mindset that I enjoy being here, then you have a chance to learn something. But for the kids, for the people just in life, when you show up wherever and you don't want to be there, you're screwed. You're not going to learn anything. You know, I had a teacher, my ideal teachers, and one of the teachers I remember, um, I remember him saying this all the time, and, and he would, not all the time, like every day, but at least once every three weeks, he would say, I love doing this. I love being here. I love this. Um, and even if he was lying, he said the words, I love doing this. It sinks in. If they love doing this, that starts off, that's at top down. If the leader says they love this, then the people underneath will start to love it. What, you know, and, and maybe that's what they do over New England Patriots organization. But when that instructor says, I love this stuff, I love history, I love studying it, I love learning it, I love teaching it. And when he does that, then suddenly I love sitting in here. It, it, it's infectious. Um, and so when I walked into the classroom, I had to love it. And sometimes I got bored with it. So I had to create the geography monkey. And it was helpful that I had one girl who hated the geography monkey. It freaked her out. So, of course, I had to do it more. <laughs> uh, you know, she just hated that thing. It was creepy. I still have it. It's in my back cabinet. Um, I, started, I started carrying around this stick. And it was kind of fun. And it was fun because I had a relationship with their math teacher. So I would steal a stick when he was off for lunch. And everyone, I'd bang around, and sometimes I'd break it, so I'd have to tape it up real good, go back into his room when he wasn't there, stick it in, and take a different one. And after a while, he noticed that a lot of his sticks are broke. <laughs> um, and then the kids tattled on me, because that's what they do. And, they, and that was fun, too. Uh, he had a kiddo, opened up pencil sharpener, spilled all the shavings everywhere. He was messing around with it. So then he made the kid go out. Two kids were actually doing that. Uh, they tried fixing it, and it just made a bigger mess, and he just lost his marbles and said, hey, listen here. You go in, you get the vacuum cleaner, and you vacuum my room. And the other kid stood there and goes, you are going to go vacuum Salah's room. So all of a sudden, I'm sitting teaching in, or history class, and this kid walks in, not a word. Just walks in, plugs in the vacuum, and starts vacuuming in the middle of my geography class. It's like, <laughs> and I, I, this has to be from that guy, I don't know. And, you know, he didn't say a word. He finished vacuuming racked up the cord and just walked out the door. And, you know, that's the sort of thing that kids will remember. They'll remember that. Um, they'll remember uh, the, the one thing I, I'll hold on to very dearly, even to this day. I've been wrong about a lot of things in teaching, and, and I've changed my ways a lot, especially as I've taken over as an administrator. Um, but one thing is, is certain is that kids will define you by a moment, by two or three memories will define your classroom you you say i'm your favorite teacher and it might be based on five observations that you remember fondly you don't remember every day but you remember those five i rem i went to a graduation of a kid i had in class and he said mr sell I, I really liked your class i said he said i didn't know much about you because i was new he says i didn't know if i'd really like you at all but this one time and it's, he based his entire opinion about my teaching. He sat in my class for 172 days. And he remembered this one time when one kid was picking on another kid about his new haircut. And the other kid was quiet and kind of meek and timid. And the other, and the first one was very, he wasn't a very nice kid. Mm -hmm. And he's picking on him pretty harshly. And I just, I, I kind of lost my temper and I let him have it. And I said, somebody who's got a haircut like yours shouldn't ever speak about anybody else's haircut because you look like a moron. Sit down and shut up. You know, I just let him have it. And, and he just sat there. And that, the kid I was at his graduation, he said, that day that you picked or you picked out so-and-so for picking on this kid, he says, from that point on, you were my favorite. And that's all he remembers. He doesn't remember a darn thing about geography. 
I probably got a D. But uh, you walk around, you're going to be defined by a moment, maybe a couple moments. Or you've been in my class for four years or whatever, mm-hmm. so you have quite a few more moments. But there may be a time when you remember your favorite teacher because of that one thing. And as a teacher, you have to be ready for them to record any moment as that one thing they remember. So make sure every moment you have with them is good. Um, and I, I, I now know that. I see that now, now that I've lived long and I've talked, I've looked back and talked to former students who say, you're my favorite teacher. And I say, why? And they remember that two or three things. Remember this time you did this for me. Remember this time when you did this for her and you didn't think anybody noticed. Um, and that's, that's what you're defined by. It's scary that you go to school 172 days, you work hard, you know, somebody who goes and does everything right and you make one mistake, that's what they'll remember. But if you do that one thing, that's good. So you better make sure you're doing more good than you do things you're not proud of. I've done plenty of things I'm not proud of. Uh, you know, I've made mistakes all over the place. For my birthday once, I just met a girl at the door and said, you got to go to the office. She goes, why? I said, it's my birthday. And I don't want you in my room. <laughs> what? Uh, she's, she knew why. Okay. <laughs> she, was, she was one of those kids that just, I said, it's my birthday. And I remember she just smiled. Said, yeah, all right. Makes sense. And she went. <laughs> like, oh. So, yeah, there's times when I'm not proud of where I am. I'm not proud of what I've done. But if you don't make mistakes, you don't learn stuff. That's true. And adolescents, they make a lot of mistakes. Hard for teachers and hard for adults to remember that. All of us come from making mistakes. And the influences of today on these kids, I think, makes it harder and harder to be that age probably than it ever was. They have... Kids are the same. Kids are kids. They want to be popular. They want to be liked. They want to be accepted. Just like they did when you were a kid. They Just like they did when I was a kid and when my grandparents were kids. However, they have infinite access to information, infinite access. That's what they have now is infinite access. You buy them a $1,000 phone, give it to them, and just hope for the best. Mm -hmm. They can look up how to make a bomb. They can look up all kinds of horrible sex things and, and, you know, know, I don't even know what a podcast is and I'm sitting on one. That's the last thing I want to get to before we... (laughs) We <laughs> finish the conversation, and I, I guess we'll, we'll we'll go to that now. So you just mentioned, though, that there might be memories, like the one... I don't remember any specific moment from your class, probably because my memory is getting worse and worse as I got older. In fact, one of the more recent times is in Broadville, I contracted Lyme disease, and my memory has been worse ever since then. I've, I'm healthy now, totally, but I felt my brain like doing some weird things when I got Lyme disease. So maybe a, a year ago, I would have had a memory, but I don't anymore. But I do just remember it being a fun class, a fun learning environment, unlike any, not, not, not every place was like that. Some place you go in, it's just like everyone kind of didn't want to be there. And that's no, that's not ideal. So thank you for providing a fun environment. And even if you have bad moments that maybe you did have at sometimes more, far more often, it was good, good moments and fun to be there. So thank you for that. All right. Well, thank you. I, I I love to say I did it for the kids. I didn't. I did it so I wouldn't get bored. Yeah, but that works then. It worked. And then you mentioned the podcast thing. We talked on the phone last night briefly to set this up today, and you you really don't know what a podcast is, which it seemed like, yeah, which I is don't. okay. And that's what I'm realizing. I like podcasts. I listen to lots of podcasts. I started a podcast, and as I'm trying to make this thing grow, I realize oh, people don't know what podcast enough people don't know what podcasts are or don't give a crap about them and aren't aren't if not everyone's gonna listen not everyone needs to listen but it's hard to present something to someone and they don't know what it is and they're just not that interested so it explained to me what it's like to not really know what a podcast is like so you hear the word what what does that mean to you well i know conan o'brien has a podcast because he advertises that when i'm watching big bang theory on reruns because i have cable because i'm old (laughs) and um, and on Big Bang Theory, Will Wheaton had a podcast where he talked to Penny and and Leonard. And I'm thinking this is like a remote radio show that you access on the Internet. That's kind of how I'm picturing it in my head. And I know I hate the sound of my own voice, as most people do. Uh, you know, I sound like James Earl Jones in here, but I know what's coming out doesn't. Um, 
No, it, it does. This, <laughs> I'm, this is James Earl Jones with me today. <laughs> Luke, I am your father. Wasn't that real? <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just pictured it's like a, a radio show that's that's web-based, and you can you can replay it or something. That's my guess. Yeah, it's an audio program that... If you ever listen back to it, of course, you could listen to the website where some people that maybe have never listened before but knew that you were on or you told some people are listening to this right now and you can listen from the website. Or there's all kinds of apps that people listen to these on. And I'm sure there's an app already on your phone. I can't say I'm sure. It's quite possible if there's one already on your phone or very easily downloadable, one of many that you could listen to this and listen to other episodes. And I, a guy like you, especially if you have some more time coming up very soon, all the kids will be out of the house. And you're going to have a little more time. I found... There's so many things interesting to listen to on podcasts, and it's been a part of my life for several years now just to hear other people, their stories, what they've learned, whatever topic that I like. It's it's all out there. So I, I think it's exciting that there are people that haven't found this yet, haven't discovered that while you're driving around, and I don't know how much driving you necessarily do, or while you're getting ready in the morning, or while you're making your breakfast, or while you're going for a walk. There are things to learn that could be presented to you in audio form or entertained by or whatever else they do for you. But that's there's so much out there. It's a really big and growing industry. And I think that's kind of the way the world is moving because people are always doing something. And to sit and read a long book takes too long to read an article. People, it's a way to capture information, entertainment while on the go. And this is this is my first best attempt at it with the people I know show. Well, this is I'm glad I'm a person, you know. It was kind of fun. I'm probably going to have to look up this, at least this one, to see your podcast here. Uh, I'll avoid the one of mine because, like I said, I hate my own voice. It sounds terrible. But, um, you know, I don't drive very much. I can see these things being pretty popular when you have to commute from Maple Grove to Minneapolis. The few times I have to drive down the cities, I just, I hate everything. I hate everybody who's in front of me, and I pity anybody who's behind me. It's just terrible. Traffic is horrible. How do you do it? I don't get that. I, I, I tend to avoid those times of the day where it's worst. Ugh. You know, we have to go down the cities, you know, school stuff, uh, sports games, um, conferences. And it's just brutal. I see my family. You know, I leave like a 10 at night because that's the only time that I can drive through there and not just hate myself. And I used to do that all the time. I don't understand. But I think a podcast would at least take the edge off. You're listening it really does. To something. Some people enjoy their commutes because they get that's their time to be able to listen to whatever shows that they like listening to. I believe when, that that's it's a real thing. When I was a kid, I listened to uh, 92 KQRS Tom Bernard, who uh, you know, you probably yes. heard of him. He's down there, Long Prairie Boy. Oh, I might have known that once and then forgotten. You probably did. He, uh, you know, back when you were in school, you probably remember when Browerville High School canceled Halloween. You don't remember that? Why? Why? Because the Fargo Dome section finals was at 5 o'clock. Oh, Friday. yeah. We moved Halloween to some we other moved day. It to the next day. The Saturday. town moved Halloween because the football team was playing a Halloween. Oh, yeah. And it was I front page on the Browerville Blade. You know, just to announce to everybody, we moved Halloween so we can get up to the football game. Remember, the community really supports its town. Yeah. Well, no one had been here anyhow. Yeah, right. So they, they just made the proclamation we're going to move Halloween to the next day. And they put it in the newspaper on the front page so everybody understood that. Tom Bernard got the Broadway Blade. <laughs> and boy, howdy. My my brothers were down in the cities and they called me up when that came up, when he started talking. They said, Tom Bernard is lighting up your little town for changing Halloween. I was like, how, how did he know? I mean, and, but yeah, he's from Long Prairie. His mom lived there until she passed away. And... <sighs> And he knew Browerville very well. He went out to Browerville, came up here quite a bit as a child. So he talked about it once in a while when I was down in the city. So when we moved up here from the cities back in 1994, I remember that about it anyway. And people, people like those, those morning shows, I think people can kind of get addicted to with their favorite radio show personality. So yeah, the pod, podcasts are that, except some You're of them are... Some are live. Some are radio shows. I think the first ones were radio shows recorded so you can listen to later. And then people realize, well, you can just record a radio show that never actually makes it on any radio station, but serves the same function, and people can listen to it whenever they want to. It's on demand. That'd be nice. An on-demand radio show. That's what it is. That's what a podcast is. So now now oh, you I, know, and now oh, people listening to our episode for the first time ever listening to a podcast now have a slightly better understanding of 
of what it is. Well, I'm glad I could be there for it. Yes. Well, thank you for taking the time today on this. I know you got a very, very busy Saturday going on today. No, not no. really. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm back in town for my, my mother's birthday, and it was, it was nice, I think, every time I come back to maybe see some people from my past. And thanks today for it, it being you, PJ. Well, that was nice to be here. Thank you. Thanks for listening to People I Know Show. A link is in the show notes for the Tom Brady Browerville news story that PJ appeared in last year that we reference in the conversation. Links are also in the show notes for the People I Know Show Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube accounts. Please subscribe or follow those accounts when you visit them. If you'd like to help me make the show grow, leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else you are listening. Subscribing to the podcast and interacting with the social media posts and other content online also helps. Please also encourage at least one other person to listen to this episode or a different episode, or you can share your favorite episode on your social media page. And feel free to email your feedback directly to me, Kurt Carstensen, by using the email address peopleiknowshow at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.